Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful week. I um, wanted to spend this week to reflect, frankly, on a lot of that's happened in the last year from a from our perspective as angel investors. So at FJ Labs in uh, 2020, we invested in 146 startups. And uh, this year, we're probably on a run rate of investing in 200 to 250 startups. So pretty insane from a volume perspective. And we're so busy basically dealing with like all the inbound deal flow, reviewing the companies, deciding to invest or not, and then helping them, that it's important to sometimes take a step back because if you're only doing, you're not spending the time to think. And so uh, about a month ago, went to Turks and Caicos and um, took time to be reflective and think through, okay, of all the things we've done, all the companies we've invested in, what are the trends that are we seeing? And what I wanted to do today with all of you is share the latest trends that we've uh, seen in marketplaces over the last 12 months as across the plethora of companies investments we've made there are clearly a few mega trends that are appearing at, at a global level so without any further ado let's get started so welcome to episode 29 the latest trends in online marketplaces So put together a quick presentation, uh, summarizing pretty much all of the things we've seen in the last 12 months that are emerging as trends. And you know, out of the fact that we invested in um, probably 200 companies or so in the last uh, 12 months, uh, there are a few ma major things that are coming out. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just go directly to each of them uh, rather than enunciate the list. And, um, Happy to answer questions along the way and, and at the end. So one big mega trend is the rise of like B2B FMCG marketplaces. So basically, especially in the developing world where a lot of sales are controlled by like small mom and pop grocery stores, you know, by big equivalents, all of these guys have been running their businesses on Excel, they don't have in inventory management, and they don't really have an amazing way of managing the relationships for how their the, the, how they're open, getting their own inventory. And we started seeing all around the world, but frankly, these days, even in the US, and the emergence of these B2B marketplaces that are helping these independent grocery stores and corner stores get all of the products. And we've invested in many, many of them. But we, we invested in one like in, Namib in Namibia, like Jabu. We looked at, we did one in uh, Nigeria. We did Cheaper in Colombia and Mexico. We did Magaloop in Germany. Now this trend works better in markets where the where distribution and, and grocery sales are basically massively fragmented. So it doesn't work nearly as well in a place like France, let's say, where you have like the Carrefour or casinos that have like a very large share of distribution. But in places where a lot of small grocery stores and mom and, mom and pops and bodegas control it, it makes a lot of sense for there to be an emergence of these B2B marketplaces. And they all have like slightly different nuances. Some take inventory, some don't take inventory, some uh, do the logistics, some purely introduce you to the to the companies that, that you're ready, are your clients, some pick the very best supplier for you. So there are nuances there, but definitely total mega trend. We've invested in many of these around the world and it's continuing to emerge. And by the way, in some countries that we're seeing like four of them, like in Pakistan, I think we saw four and it's unclear which of these will be the winner that at some point we'll pull the trigger and make an investment once we think we've identified the the clear winner in the category. Second big category is super fast e-commerce, frankly starting with the grocery category. So these are two companies that came out of Russia and um, and Turkey. It's called Getir in Turkey and uh, Samokat in Russia, where they realized that if you build a lot of dark stores in a city, and you can have like a limited selection of SKUs, you can actually provide an extremely, an amazing user experience where you can provide, you can deliver groceries in like 10, 15 minutes at more or less the same price as you would getting it from normal stores because you don't have all the cost structure of the normal stores. The, instead of having all the labor costs and all of the real estate inventory costs, you basically, um, 
just have the the dark stories and then you have like last mile delivery people and so it's very operationally heavy you have your own inventory so it takes a lot of capital and this is becoming the capital war people have realized this is interesting so in every major time period of the internet there's like massive capital wars that are being fought there's a period of time where people are fighting over becoming the Uber or Lyft, and you saw that people being played out in many different countries with lots of competitors backed by the loss of capital. You saw it being backed as well or being played out in um, in the um, in the food delivery business. So you know, the DoorDash versus Seamless Grubhub versus Uber Eats versus many other. And this happened, frankly, in every major geography. There was a scooter war for a while, the Lime, Bird, where lots of capital being sent uh, or put into these companies. This is the, the massive battlefield right now. Uh, where a lot of deep pocketed investors are investing in the category. And um, most people are like, wait a minute, how could this actually work? But when you actually look at scale, once the stores are covering, I uh, have enough deliveries that they, they cover the costs, the, the unit economics do work. And we looked at, at the unit economics at Gitir in Turkey and Samokat in Russia, you end up being with a net 17 net margin per order once you're there. But along the way, until you have scale, it's going to be a bloodbath. I mean, in New York alone, I think you have like Gorillas, Fridge No More, 1520, Joker, etc. And so it's going to be an absolute, absolute uh, bloodbath with billions of venture money incinerating the process. But ultimately, there should be a hundred billion dollar company coming out of it, given that grocery is a ginormous category. It's uh, grocery is 500 billion a year in, in the U.S., uh, it's 200 billion in, like, in, in a place like the UK. I mean, it is enormous. And so the companies you can build here are huge. And by the way, at least the company we backed, which is Joker, um, their aspiration is not just 3,000 SKUs to go after grocery, it's 10,000 SKUs of all the things that you might need on a regular basis across all the different categories. And they see themselves as the competitor to Amazon. And so the idea is if you need an iPad, we'll get it delivered to you in 15 minutes or a computer. So it won't be a huge selection, so it won't be the store for everything, but the things that you most likely want will deliver to you in 10, in 10, 15 minutes. And the NPS, the user experience that you have is absolutely insane. The, you know, it, you, you start embedding in, in, in your normal life. I mean, so for the, the name of one of the companies, Fridge No More, is kind of the idea of what they have, but it, it's crazy. I was like, oh, I forgot to buy this. Boom, order it, delivered in 10 minutes. So like, you, you no longer need to worry about like how much, whether or not you're forgetting something when you go to the grocery store. So the NPS is huge. I think there's going to be a $100 billion company that will come out of this, though, of course, there might be a lot of losers in VC capital incinerated along the way. Uh, next big category or ne next big uh, mega trend is the emergence of these uh, Amazon third-party reseller roll-ups. So the very famous company in the category is Thrasio. So what Thrasio does is they go to these uh, essentially mom and pop little e-commerce stores that have emerged that are selling at Amazon and they're doing a couple hundred K in revenues, a couple million in revenues, a couple hundred K in EBITDA. And the problem is if you're the, these mom and pop owners on selling on Amazon, you may be doing really well, but you, you, you live in fear. And you live in fear that maybe someone else will take over the category from you, that maybe Amazon will launch an Amazon Basics or replace you. By the way, the latter is mostly an unfounded fear. Um, Amazon, when they launched, was 100% their own inventory. Today, they're ma ma majority of marketplace. So 66% of their sales are a marketplace. And increasingly, they'd rather be the marketplace rather than selling their own products. So it's not as big a threat as people assume it is. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the first time many of these uh, small mom and pop founders have had money and have had a successful company. And so they're willing to sell. And so what Thrasio realizes is they can go and buy these companies for three times EBITDA, four times EBITDA, four, five times EBITDA. They can then use their operational expertise. They can improve their purchasing power, improve their logistics, improve uh, Im Im improve uh, marketing. And then once they have them, they can cross sell products between the different brands and to the different customer bases to make them much more operationally efficient. Now they, they, they fund the company mostly through debt. So they get debt financing to do the acquisition and they've been able to, they were created in 2019, at least that's when their seed ran happened. And they are now in talks to do SPAC for 9 billion. It's the fastest growing, I think, profitable unicorn in the history where they went from zero to 9 billion essentially in two years. 
Now, that, that company has led to a lot of other companies emerging. Obviously, the, this is kind of the modern equivalent of the search fund, um, kind of a private equity-ish play. And we're seeing many of these type of Thrasio, Amazon third-party business acquirers popping up. And we've backed a number of them around the world. There are many in Europe. There are many in, now in India, uh, in the US. And we're backing them in different geographies. This is not a winner-take-all category. You can even imagine that some of these will verticalize. Interesting nuance here or in this category is um, this has not quite happened for Shopify. Because on Shopify, in a way, there might even be dis decreasing returns to scale. And so the Shopify, you have to see to be one brand selling one product or one type of product, and you can't actually be cross-selling, cross-marketing, and doing all the things you can do on Amazon. So to, to date, it's really the Amazon third-party businesses that have been scaling very effectively. And definitely a mega trend. We've invested in many of the players in the category and uh, doing really, really well. Now, you know, here, as I mentioned, the it's not um, winner take all. Um, so there will be many players. TBD, whether or not we see diminished returns, because with all the, the players entering, the multiples that people are paying in acquisition are increasing. I mean, I think it used to be as low as 2x EBITDA. Now it's probably closer to 5x. And in places like India, we're actually seeing the multiples being even higher than that. So TBD, I had plays out. But that said, the category is still very compelling. Next big mega trend is the creator of the passion economy. There was this famous, um, very famous um, um, blog post on the fact that you only need 1,000 true fans in order to make a living in the future. And that's actually great because in the future of work, I think people should be doing the, the work they love and turning their passion into financeable uh, operations rather than living nine to five jobs or working nine to five jobs that are not compelling. And, and then having to have money to do the things they love in their spare time. Here, if you can actually make a living out of the things you love, you're way better off. And we're seeing many ways in which this is playing out. Um, we're seeing monetiza monetization tools for different types of creators and that are all doing rather well. You know, so for podcasters, for companies like Anchor, for content creators on the audio side, you have like companies like Noble. For if you're, if you're an author, Substack is like genius, right? The, some of the best writers make, make way more on Substack than they ever could, you know, working for the New York Times, creating your own audience. So the creator economy and letting people basically monetize their skill set is extraordinary. In, um, in, in this category, we have, you know, if, if you're an influencer or, or a third tier or D, C tier, B tier, D tier celebrity, you have the, the, you have the cameos of the world. And we've actually backed a cameo equivalent for Europe and, and, and Canada called Memo. We backed one for, for Latin America. So that world is emerging. And today it's only frankly relationship between the celebrity uh, or you're buying a shout out for a birthday, but ultimately I can imagine it developing to being in a, a more ongoing relationship with your fans. Um, same thing if you want to back someone who's a content creator or an artist. Patreon is an amazing way to go after the category and, 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 and a scale that allowing a lot of people to basically live off of their passion. Um, Twitch, in a way, falls in that category as well, where if you're a gamer, you can make a living of your passion of gaming. And um, it's interesting that the people that do the best are actually the entertainers are also really good, not just necessarily the very best players in each category. Only fans, you know, love it or hate it in terms of the category they're in, also is allowing a lot of people to to make a living um, w without needing to do traditional jobs. And we're seeing now a lot of companies or tools that are allowing people to monetize their passion. So we're investors, for instance, a company called Ribbon. Um, Ribbon allows yoga studios or, or people that, um, that, 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 or yoga instructors to manage their entire business. So you can schedule classes, you can be online, it can be offline, you can do certificating, you can actually create videos that you can sell packages or solutions to. And so it's basically allowing you to monetize uh, in your entire business. And these types of businesses are also emerging in, um, they're, they're also emerging and adapted for each different geography. So for instance, in uh, Brazil, where WhatsApp is part of the fabric of society and everyone's using WhatsApp, we're investors in a company called uh, ChatPay, where people were 
using or creating classes on WhatsApp and people are, are following along and paying a subscription for. So one of the their biggest influencers is a weight loss celebrity and she has like hundreds or thousands of women that basically every morning will go, log in and like film themselves or put a photo of themselves with their weight and then like doing some exercise and it creates like peer pressure for people to succeed and they're doing extremely, extremely well. And in fact, the creator and passion economy is also coming to the crypto world or the web 3.0 world where a lot of uh, creators, influencers or celebrities are, are starting or going to be in a position to create their own tokens. So you have companies like BitSky that allow this to happen or Socios and Chili's. I mean, you recently saw um, Paris Saint-Germain announce that they would issue, which is a, for the Paris soccer team, which has Messi where they're playing for them, they would issue tokens for people to be able to decide on like some of the strategy of the team and, and Messi was highly supportive of that. So we're in the beginning phases still of the creator economy. It's going to be a massive mega trend for the years to come. We've placed many bets here, both in the Web2 world and the Crypto Web3 world. And uh, I am could not be more excited that to, to have people be able to live off their passion rather than doing jobs that for the, many of them were repetitive and not that intellectually stimulating. So I mentioned a few of those examples, you know, ChatPay, which is the coaching over WhatsApp, which is doing really, really well in Brazil, or Memo, which is kind of a better version of uh, Cameo for Europe. Uh, next big trend is um, helping uh, businesses or uh, run their businesses better. And you know, when, when we told people originally, for instance, we're investors in Slice, which is a pizza food ordering company, people were like, wait a minute, I can order pizza on Uber Eats or DoorDash or Seamless. Why do I need a, 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 an app to order pizza? That doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. But if you actually put yourself in the shoes of Luigi that owns the pizzeria, Going back to the core vision of like, in the future, they should be doing the job they love to do and nothing else. You know, Luigi got into the business because he loved making pizza. He loved interacting with his customers. He did not get into the business because he wanted to negotiate deals with the like suppliers and build a website and answer comments on Google and Yelp and TripAdvisor. And so a lot or a slew or plethora of companies are coming in to basically help these uh, small business owners run their businesses better. So Slice is a prototypical example of that. Essentially, it's a Shopify for helping uh, pizzerias basically build their entire online presence. They'll pick up the phone for you. They'll create your site. They'll help you with packaging. They'll provide you with a point of sale system. Uh, Joebox does the same thing for plumbers, but we're really seeing it across the category. A um, few other examples, Fresha will help uh, barbershop owners manage all their bookings and, and availability within the barbershop. We'll provide them with a point of sale system. And by mega, mega, mega trend of helping individual, well, SMB owners especially, run their businesses better, usually by providing a free SaaS tool. Monetization can vary. Sometimes you're monetizing the SaaS tool, sometimes you're monetizing the marketplace. But definitely an amazing future trend in the future of work and helping SMBs do, do the job that they love to do. Next big trend is uh, online used car marketplaces. It, what's interesting is um, until, and, and, and probably COVID played a very large role here, we're now seeing a fundamental shift to online car buying. It used to be that yes, there were transactions that were happening in the used car world, you know, on the, on the eBay Motors or Craigslist of the world, but the transactional people were not necessarily completely comfortable going in and, 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 and buying cars sight unseen. But a few companies, including one we had built in the early days that sadly failed, was trying to help shift that perception. And then, of course, COVID helped because people didn't want to go and take the risk of meeting or going to the showrooms. And, and so we're seeing a, a massive explosion of car marketplaces. Now, in a way, it's been a long time coming. A lot of these companies have existed for a long time, but they've come of age in the COVID time. So if you look at Carvana um, in terms of uh, selling cars to consumers, the, they've created an experience where you can actually test drive the car and you can buy the car it, with risk-free because you can return it. And as a result, people have been willing to do that. And, and that model is taking the world by storm. So we've invested in the car van of Canada, a company called Clutch. So of course, Kavak in Latin America is, is, is growing. And the 
you know, Carvana, I think they went public at a three billion valuation since then it was like 10X or 15X as their volume has grown, largely accelerated by the willingness now of consumers to buy things sight unseen. So COVID has been a massive accelerant and the category as a whole, now you have like billion dollar players all across the world. I mean, you have Kazoo that SPAC'd in, in the UK. And it's also happening in, in the B2B world. I mean, in the US you have ACB auctions, we're investors in the, um, B2B car marketplace for Germany called Car on Sale, but frankly, the entire category is being re revolutionized. Next big trend, though, this one is a little bit earlier, but we did invest in a number of these and we're seeing it emerge, is um, many small shop owners, especially in the emerging markets, don't really have any accounting software, they don't really, or they're not connected to anything. And so we're seeing a number of companies that are, have emerged that are basically providing these small owners with an e easy way to issue invoices, to, to manage their inventory, and everything was done for free. And many of them now have like millions, in some cases, 10 million users per month on Catabook to basically run the your little mom and pop operation. In this case, it's really literally, it could be a stand or saw stores with like a couple thousand dollars a month that it, that we're not we're doing everything pen and paper now this trend is not completely realized yet because there's the monetization aspect has not yet been demonstrated but we're seeing actually a few interesting ways that this could play out you can imagine that you can build an interesting factoring business on the back end of this because most of your most people would like to pay over time or would like to pay would like to pay for their suppliers later if they could and so you could imagine different monetization opportunities here but early trends Another mega trend where investors at a few of these just talked one in Pakistan that we're very excited by, but frankly, it's happening in India. It's happening all around the world. Next big trend, which is definitely a trend in China and is not yet clear if it's going to be a trend in the rest of the world, but because it's taking China by storm, it's being invested around the world. So in China today, there's uh, about 20% of the commerce or purchases of e-commerce are done through live shopping. So it's kind of a combination of entertainment and shopping because you're seeing a video with someone selling you in your phone, mostly, um, commerce. So it's kind of like QVC uh, or Home Shopping Network brought to your phone. And um, what's interesting is that the, the winners in China have really been the, the incumbents. So it's like Taobao, which is one of the leading uh, marketplaces and, and e-commerce sites in, in, in China, as a Taobao Live, it's one of the larger players. And so all the major players are really coming from there. And when people saw that live shopping was becoming a, a, a trend, it started being funded in the US and around the world. Now, there are two main categories of people have been going after. You have people going after collectibles, so the Shop Shop Live or whatnot, and then makeup. Um, with uh, newness um, or, or, or super great. Now, whether or not, how big this ends up being in the US is less clear, but we've definitely seen, because it's worked so extraordinarily well in China, um, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of people trying to replicate this around the world. And we haven't yet made a bet in the category. We've talked to many of the players, but as we're thinking through, okay, what is discovery in the future? You know, I think, sir, if you know what you're looking for, okay, the Amazons of the world are great, but if you don't know what you're looking for and you want a more authentic or experience where you connect with other brands, brands that are more that are that are more socially responsible and conscious, how do you discover those? And perhaps live streaming is one of those ways that discovery will play out. And so as we're thinking through the future of discovery, the this may very well be one of the major elements. Now, that's it for the core trends here. Now, I've already mentioned I, they are part trends, but I cover them elsewhere, so I'll, I'll reiterate quickly. Um, decentralized finance, crypto, and NFTs, or the Web3 world, of course, that has been a mega trend. The, the DeFi explosion really happened in the last 12 months and, and took the world by storm with the creation of like, or reinvention of all the underlying rails of finance in crypto. The, the Uniswaps of the world going from nothing to like billions a day in trading. But I did uh, um, another episode covering what's up with crypto where I cover all that happened. But definitely one of the major mega trends of the last 12 months has been the explosion of crypto and especially in the, uh, in the decentralized finance world and the NFT world. And so if you're interested in that, you can uh, check out episode 27, which is what's up with crypto. Um, but it's definitely one of the bigger mega trends. So 
as I look forward to what's coming in the future, um, that's episode 28, where I covered like, what are the things that I think are going to be mega trends of the future? And we'll see, I guess, the next 12 month or 24 month, uh, w- whether or not those predictions turned out to be true. But my current bets are the continuation of the no code, low code revolution, um, psychedelics going from uh, fringe to mainstream at some point in the next four or five years. And of course, the continued explosion of crypto. Beyond that, you know, TBD, I have another set of bets. Um, but I'll probably do another episode in about a year where we look, okay, in the last year we invested, yeah, that's one might be 300 companies. <laughs> what are the things or, or the trends that emerge out of that? So with that, I pause, um, see if anyone has any uh, questions. And um, if not, we'll end and uh, we'll, we'll start the next few episodes where I'll restart having guests where we'll talk to extraordinary founders about their journeys. We have uh, the, the founder of Shippo, uh, she's absolutely amazing. She created a unicorn company in the logistics space, which of course is helping last while coming. We have uh, the founder of Clipper and the, and the DeFi crypto space coming and many, many other exciting guests on the horizon. I think uh, we're done for the week with, with that. Thank you. And um, I'll see you guys uh, in a few weeks.